Okay, uh, the book of Isaiah this morning. At, uh, at a time when uh, I didn't realize what a blessing it was, uh, at a time in my life when I did not realize what a blessing it was, uh, God privileged Thelma and I to go to a Christian college, a private college. And uh, it was blessing upon blessing for our science professor not to deny God and not to deny his existence. And so we were uniquely blessed, uh, I think, in being privileged to attend a Christian college. I admire students today who go and face that and who remain strong in their faith. Will you worship the Lord through the reading and the study of His Word with me now? Would, can we do that? Are our hearts prepared uh, to do that uh, just, just uh, right now? Since we're studying the book of Isaiah, will you turn to 2 Kings, please? <laughs> and when, and when, you, when you have found 2 Kings, then turn just a little bit further into the Bible and find 2 Chronicles. We want to look at three books in the Bible. And we have some uh, uh, Bible, small blue Bibles, if you see one. Uh, there's uh, one up here, a different color cover. But if you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, please uh, scout around. Uh, somebody raise your hand if you need a Bible. Uh, and uh, somebody will see that we find one for you. Let's read, uh, let's read to begin with 2 uh, uh, second, uh, second Chronicles. Uh, then we'll go back to 2 uh, Kings. But let's read 2 uh, let's read Chronicles. And uh, that is uh, chapter 27. I did not give you the chapter. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 27. Oh, Father, will you bless and Father, will you help? Lord God, we set aside the cares of this world and the concerns of our physical beings. Uh, God, we bring our pain and our suffering and our hurt unto you. And we pray, Father, that the glory of your word may supersede and overcome it all. For well, Father, we want to worship you this morning, and we want to find that avenue of praise and, and, and uh, success in walking in your light, in the light of your love. Father, we want to offer our life song to you this morning, just now. And so, God, as we read your word, may it come alive to us, we pray. Over in the first chapter of Isaiah, uh, which uh, uh, we'll get to uh, in a moment, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, that's the second king that is mentioned as Isaiah begins his book. Uh, the visions that he saw, he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uh, then when we turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 27, we see Jotham ascending the throne, succeeding his father Uzziah. Uh, 27, 1 in 2 Chronicles. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. Now that'll help you uh, live a better Christian life by getting all of those names before you. Uh, Joth Jotham uh, did, uh, did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Now wait a minute. Ooh, well, we've got to finish this verse. However, he did not enter the temple of the Lord. But the people continued acting in a corrupt manner, acting corruptly. The king did not step in to the house of the Lord, did not step into the temple to lead the people uh, by example to worship God. He built, however, the upper gate of the house of the Lord 
And by the way, that, that wall and that gate still stands today uh, that uh, Jotham built. Uh, he built extensively the wall of Ophel, and that wall is still here today. Moreover, he built cities in the hill country of Judah, and he built fortresses and towers on the wooded hills. He fought with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. So that the Ammonites gave Jotham during that year a hundred talents of silver, 10,000 cores of wheat, and 10,000 cores of barley. The Ammonites also paid him the same amount in the second and third year. So Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord is God. Now, wait a minute. Don't forget what we read back there in the second verse. But he did not go worship God. You know, you can do good things and you can do godly doings. But until you have worshiped God, you have not come before him in a manner in which it is necessary to do so for victory in your life. Now, did, did all those words make sense? Yeah. You can't do good things and have victory with God in your life. It just doesn't work that way. Jotham the king is a demonstration of that. So he became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord. And then those next three verses just say how the rest of the things about Jotham are recorded uh, in the book of Kings. Now, we're ready, therefore, then to turn to the book of Kings in 2 Kings and uh, with 2 Kings, it is in chapter 15. We're going to read something that is much the same as what we have just read in Chronicles. But it is an amazing thing that when God put the scriptures before us, when God gave us his holy word, even from days of old, there is verification about the truth of the things that we read. What was it in the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel? Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, became king. Now that's what we just got through reading over here. When Joseph was 25 years old, he became king. And uh, uh, he was 25 years old. Verse 33 in 2 Kings. 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 16 years. We've already read this. Uh, there in the Chronicles. His mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Only the high places were not taken away. Now what, what's the big deal? On the one hand, it sounds like this is a godly king. It sounds like he's doing the things that a godly king ought to be doing. But he did not go into the temple to worship God for himself, and he did not tear down and destroy the places of idol worship where the people went to worship idols. The high places, that's what is meant by high places, is uh, uh, places where idol were worshipped. And uh, they were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on those high places. Then it talks about him building the upper gate of the house of the Lord, and so on. Uh, there were two things, though, that I wanted to pick out about this man, Jotham. Jotham uh, became king. Many of the things that he had seen his father Uzziah do, he continued to perform, except that he himself did not go into the house of God. How many of... Your parents, my parents, went into the house of God, but when we became responsible for deciding whether or not to go, we didn't. Well, some things that were just like in Jotham's day are just like in Bacon's day, Morrill's day, and put your name in there. Humanity hasn't really changed all that much. And it's almost as though we want to depend on our parents to make things right enough so that we get into heaven, but it doesn't work that way. We've got sense enough to know the scripture well enough to know and realize that that is not true. You cannot get to glory based on how good a Christian your parents were. You must come before God yourself. 
And Jotham did not do that, did not lead the people in that way. Now, the people continued to worship in the high places and worship the idols. Temple worship began to suffer. And when we read in then chapter 3, praise God we made it all the way to chapter 3 in Isaiah. Oh, stay, stay, uh, you know, keep turning the pages. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah. Now what happens, uh, interrupt that sentence right here. What happens when the king, when the government leaders, what happens when he, she, and the people do not remain faithful to God? God is go God's word is going to say to us what happens when people do not remain faithful to God, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter what temptations may jump up in front of you. What is going to happen if we fail to overcome those things and do not be faithful to God? Here's what's going to happen. Supply and support. The whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water will be taken away. Verse 2, the mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder. Now these are all things that are going to be being lost, will be being taken away. The captain of 50 and of the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan and the skillful enchanter. Those things will all be taken away. Uh, what, uh, you know, bread and water, the very sustaining elements of the meager existence uh, uh, for life, the mighty man and the warrior, there will be no more soldiers uh, coming back. The wounded warriors will be all that there will be left. The judge and the prophet, uh, there will be no righteous judge. Can you go to court today and get a righteous decision? Can you go to court today and anticipate that you will be receiving a decision from the judge seated on that bench that will be a righteous choice? You see what we're already losing, okay? Uh, I'm going to wear that t-shirt, I think. Uh, wake up and smell the bacon burning. Uh, Bonita, Bonita gave, uh, gave me a t-shirt this morning. It says fried bacon right across it. Okay, wake up and smell the bacon burning, friends. We're already losing some of these things because our nation is not remaining a godly nation. We continue to worship anything, everything, and every idol that we can imagine. Now then in uh, uh, society and government, we will be deprived of a godly one, a godly society and a godly government. We will be left to fall into confusion and disorder. Look at verse four. I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them and the people will be oppressed each one by another and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. Ladies and gentlemen, in, in our church, we are acquainted with more than one circumstance where children are telling their parents, no, I'm not going to live the way you try to tell me to live. It is my life, and I'm going to live it the way I want to live it. We already are seeing the confusion that has arisen in our nation. The youth will storm against the elder, and the picture of that storm is uh, one from nature, is a raging, uncontrollable storm like the snowstorms that have been raging the east and the northern portion of our nation for the last, uh, what, month. And the inferior will storm against the honorable. Someone who is honorable 
will come up against an inferior individual who worships an idol, and the honorable person will be put into second place. He will not be able to stand. What, ha what else happens when a nation does not honor God? Look in verses 6 through 8. We will be denied due process. In verses 6 through 8, when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, you got the picture of that? Two brothers have gone over to see daddy on, on the same day, and one of those brothers says, to, look what he says. One of the brothers says to the other, you have a cloak, you shall be our ruler. My soul in sad exile. Just because a man owns a coat, he gets to be the king? Look what it says. Do clothes make the man or does the man make clothes? You know how many folks can, uh, how many folks in leadership can, uh, men in leadership can wear a suit of clothes that uh, costs less than $500? No, n you know, nobody can wear a suit of clothes in leadership that costs less than $500. Uh, that, that's a cheap suit. And uh, when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house and says, you have a cloak, you'll be our ruler. Now then, and these ruins will be under your charge. How many of you know where Belmont, Nevada is? I didn't get a single hand this morning at the 830 service. Did, did I never take you to Belmont, Nevada? I never took, oh, I have deprived my daughter of an... <laughs> Belmont, Nevada was a gold mining town in the 19th century, gold flowed out of that place. And they built in the 19th century brick courthouses, courthouse, brick hotels. It was a going place in the 19th century. But when the gold played out, everything else went. Now there are two families, the last time I was in Belmont, Nevada, there are two families living there. This makes the Bible come alive to me. Stay with me. This yarn is going somewhere. It, you know, there are two families that live in Belmont, Nevada. That old brick courthouse that uh, was so well known and was famous in its day for its construction and design is just literally falling down. <laughs> They've got it fenced off. You can't, for safety's sake, go in there anymore. Now look at what the Bible says. Oh, these ruins will be under your charge. Now which one of those two guys that live in Belmont, Nevada is going to be the mayor? The one that got a coat? I tell you what, we're going to select you, dude, because you have got a new coat and these ruins will be what you're in charge of. That fallen down courthouse, these old rotting homes, and everything around us that is just going into decay. Look at the scripture because it lives, ladies and gentlemen. And it doesn't matter what you and I build with our hands. One day it will fall into disrepair and decay. And the quicker it, that will happen if we fail to worship and honor God. And if we fail to keep society strong and the concept of being our brother's keeper, keeping that alive, keeps society alive. But when a nation walks against God, society and government will be lost. There will be confusion and disorder. And the very theme, the very... Uh, concept of due process will be lost. We'll be choosing people based on whether they have a coat or not. And the ruins will be all that they will have charge of. On that day, he will protest saying, I will not be your healer, for in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. And the one that we select is going to be an out-and-out -out liar. His brother knows he's got a cloak. 
His brother knows that he's got enough bread for the day. But when he is saddled with responsibility, he's going to say, no, I don't want this responsibility. No, I don't have a new coat. No, I don't have any bread to eat. And will deny that he has anything. You should not appoint me to be the ruler of, peop of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against His glorious presence. And it will be it will be like is there a man among us who is called of God to preach? And that man will say, I don't want that job. Is there a man among us who could be the mayor? And that man will say, I don't want to be mayor. Is there a man among us who could aspire to the presidency and who will say, I don't want to be president. When millions upon millions of dollars are spent to bring a man into the White House of our nation, people, people raise millions of dollars to get there. But a nation against God will experience a day in which nobody wants to be president. Nobody wants to be mayor. Nobody wants to be the pastor. Nobody wants that honorable. What did it say? That the inferior will rule over the honorable. And we will become so confused. Disorder will be such that our minds will be so messed up that the honorable man will not say, I'm willing to lead. We'll turn it over to the dishonorable one. Look in verses 12 through 15 for the abuse of power that, uh, that uh, Isaiah uh, spoke about. Oh, my people, their oppressors are children. And women rule over them. We'll come back to that one maybe in a minute. Who's running for president in 2016? Just, just a question. Oh, my people, those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your path. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. Why do you do that? The abuse of power will grind people. Anybody feeling that grinding? The abuse of power results in the grinding of society, the crushing of society. And then in verses 17 through 24, uh, ladies, let me read this together with you, okay? Uh, this, uh, this, this make your heart sick, okay? Let's read these verses together in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 17 through 24. The Lord will afflict, well, let's start with 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud. You know anybody, any ladies, the daughters of Zion who are so proud and they just walk around like they own the world. You know, and, and they're, so, uh, they're so valuable, you know, that uh, gold turns yellow in their presence. Uh, uh, they're proud and uh, walk with their heads held high and seductive eyes. And they go along with mincing steps and tinkle the bangles on their feet. Therefore, the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs. And the Lord will make their foreheads bare. 
In that day, now ladies, it gets ugly here. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, their headbands, their crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains. Any, any ladies finding anything in here that... Okay. And God says all this is going to be taken away. Headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans and veils. Don't take it all. Uh, ladies, it'd be a little scary to go outside. <laughs> After this gets carried out. Now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Putrefaction is the stink of something dead. Okay. Oh. Instead of a belt, there will be a rope. Instead of well-set hair, plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. This is my man. I have picked him out. And I'm going to be with him. And we're going to go down and get us matching tattoos. And we're going to brand ourselves together. Hello? You don't see that? How far down this road have we come already? Your men will fall by the sword in those days. Father, help us. Help us to see that if we do not remain faithful as a nation that the women of our land will be deprived. Oh, ladies, how many suffer the deprivation of love and care, suffer the deprivation of home and family, suffer the deprivation of uh, a character that lets them feel like they can walk upright among the godly. When these things are taken away, it destroys who we are and who God intends that we be. Please may we see that. Now, the nation will be destroyed by war. But I want you to look. I said, I, I, talk with, I talk with our worship director about the sermons and uh, what I want to try to bring out to us from the Word of God. Preaching from the book of Isaiah. We're going to hear a lot about what we don't want to hear a lot about. And that's judgment. The book of Isaiah got a lot about judgment in it. There's 66 chapters in this book. If I do a chapter a week, this time next year we're still going to be in Isaiah. Just so you know. Just so you think about it. And I said to, said to Amy, as we were kind of putting our heads and our hearts together, <laughs> and she says, that's quite a bit of judgment, Dad. <laughs> and I said, yeah, more than the average bear can stand.
And when we read about judgment, we read in verse 11, Woe to the wicked, it shall go badly with him, for when what he deserves will be done to him. Woe to the wicked, what he deserves will be done to him. And this is about as ugly as it gets. But I want you to see what God allows every prophet who is in touch with God to be able to say. There's going to be judgment when we walk against God. All of the things we've talked about losing will be lost. Don't think that because you hadn't lost it yet, it's not going to get lost if we walk against God. But the wonderful, wonderful blessing of our God in heaven is that in the midst of all of this, look at verse 10. Say to the righteous that it'll go well for them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Praise God is right. Yeah. For those whose actions emulate the plan of Almighty God for your lives and mine, it'll go well with us. How will it go well? If God sends destruction upon Reno, Nevada, and the city catches on fire, your house is going to burn just like anybody else's house. But your soul is going to be protected. And your mind will know that God is going to keep you. And your heart can even in the time of judgment be lifted up. Now that's the blessing of doing what God wants us to do. And God let Isaiah put that truth right in the middle of all the putrefaction, the stink of death, and the loss of everything that has meaning to us. God gave us a word of hope, and it is there for us. Amen. Please know, please know, yes, there's going to be sermons on judgment. I don't know how I'm going to do all of this yet. I am struggling with this because I don't like to get up and yell and scream and point my index finger in people's faces and tell them they're going to go to hell. I don't like to do that. I would rather say, ladies and gentlemen, let's come before God and let's do so in brokenness because we know we've sinned and messed up. But we realize we can be forgiven in the name and the power and the authority of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And we can be made right and that our souls can be secure for all eternity. Those are the kinds of things that I rather would talk about. But the prophet of God was asked by God to tell people they were sinners. And I have to do that. It's God's word. But when we talk about being such sinners as we are, we can also talk about the blessing that God has for us. In the name of Jesus, the power of his blood, covering up our sins. And you remember those verses in that first chapter. So, just before we go home, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, 
be white as snow. Will they be red like crimson? They'll be as wool. And those who follow the Lord will know that blessing. Let's do it. Why don't we do it? Let's do it. While you're deciding, you and God are deciding something right now. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Okay? You and God are deciding something right now. And I don't want to, I don't want to make a lot of racket and mess up your thinking and quiet time before God in this moment. So we're going to have a, a moment of silence. You and God are reasoning out your life together right now. God, I know I need you. Oh, God. I'm sorry I've messed things up like I have. And the only thing I can do now is ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for promising me, God that it can be covered up, never to be remembered against me any longer, removed from me as far as the east is from the west. That the precious blood of your son shed upon the cross of Calvary covers up everything that I've ever done. Oh God, Help me to reason that out with you, Father. That otherwise my sin is going to be before the whole creation. But it can be hidden under the blood of Jesus. And so right now, I'm claiming the healing covering power of the blood of Jesus. Father, I'm asking for this in faith because there's nothing else that I know that will do it. And your word says that his blood will. And I claim the covering of the blood of Jesus right now. Praying for forgiveness of my sin and the gift of salvation. A salvation that will last for all eternity, that cannot be taken away from me. God, I'm claiming that by faith. Amen.